these are indeed Trans Am fenders, but is it really a Trans Am? Well, the cow tag is here, and there it is. Hey, Steve Mignani here doing the junkyard crawl at Bernardston Auto Wrecking in Bernardston, Massachusetts. Now, I was born in 1964, the year that the great one, the Pontiac GTO, came out on the scene. Well, by 1979, Pontiac was still building high-performance cars. Or were they? Here's the thing, the Pontiac Trans Am came out in 69. Ten years later, Pontiac Trans Ams were still being built, but the power plants weren't, well, no more Ram Air 4s, no more 455s. These would have come with either a 400 cubic inch Pontiac or the 403 Oldsmobile station wagon engine. But again, 79 was the first year for this urethane nose and also the last year for standard 400 or 403 power. 1980 and 81, these years they had small blocks with a single four barrel or the turbo 301. But here's the thing, 1979 saw a total of 211, 453,000 Firebirds built. Of them, 75% were formulas or Trans Ams. So that's a lot of cars. That with, in 1979, a second gas crunch. So theoretically, V8-powered pony cars shouldn't have sold. Well, they did. The public wanted these things. Now, this one is a Trans Am. It's lacking its hood, but we can add up some clues and determine that it truly is a Trans Am. Now, these, of course, came with the shaker. We'll talk about that in a second. But the Trans Am bits on this clearly are the chin spoiler, the front fender flares, and again, these are made of urethane. Speaking of this sort of, well, not urethane, it's sort of a rubberized uh, vinyl. And speaking of that, the beak on these things, starting in 79, the beautiful banshee look of 78, that beautiful sort of raccoon, hidden headlight look, Burt Reynolds, think of uh, Smoking a Bandit, gave way to this. But this is soft rubber right here. It's basically like urethane. The idea is that it would take a punch and bounce back for more. Well, okay. Aerodynamically, they were okay. But again, these right here certainly would be drag makers and even wind noise makers, but that wasn't the priority yet in 1979. We also see the front fenders, which are specific to Trans Am, and these were called air extractors. And if you didn't know, the idea behind this is that when you go down the road, there's a low pressure area created here that creates a slight suction in the engine bay. And it's not to reduce engine temperature, but rather to let air out of the front of the car to reduce lift. Again, you'd have to be going 150 miles an hour for this to really have much impact, but it looked cool. And these are indeed Trans Am fenders, but is it really a Trans Am? Well, the cow tag is here and there it is. WS4, that is the Trans Am designator for the model option and WS4 for sure. We also see that the window surround trim is blacked out, which was also a Trans Am trait. Now the VIN on this thing is partially obscured, but K would be the 403, Z would be the 400 Pontiac. Now on this one, I think I see the edge of a W, which is a little confusing. W in 1979 means 301 four barrel. It is possible. Uh, and again, I haven't documented this, but it's possible that the 301 four barrel was a step down option in 79 for Trans Am. It's kind of weird. There's a W in the fifth spot if I can see it. Now I can't open the doors on this thing to move that visor to get a full look, but it looks like a W, which is kind of weird. Um, with that said, can't get the door open, uh, but it does have the trunk spoiler, of course, which was Pontiac Trans Am, also optional on Formula and lesser Firebirds. Let's get into that right now. Now, as we get into the engine bay, of course, we can see here that this uh, is wide open, the motor's gone, and one thing that's kind of been a bit of an urban legend is that the rubber mounts on Trans Ams were thicker or more pliable than the ones on non-shaker Firebirds so that the engine could wiggle more and the shaker would do more. It's a myth. There's no difference to these rubber mounts than any other Firebird. And again, the Trans Am shaker at this point in time didn't do anything. It was sealed shut. In fact, uh, the back of it was molded in one piece. But they did one thing very well. They sold cars. And again, a total of 117,109 Trans Ams were built in 1979, including 7,500 silver 10th anniversary ones. Now, this here is a 1979 car prices guide right here. I love these things because for the most part, the data in these is provided by car manufacturers and you can kind of bank on it. So we go inside and set it down and go over this a little bit. And here is the pages for the Trans Am. And we can see the Trans Am was $62.99. That was retail, although the dealer paid $54. So he was in there for $800 profit. But check out the options here. This is the TA 6.6, which was uh, $340. And then the 6.6 .6 liter 403 on formula was $250. I believe the 6.6 .6 403 
Both three were standard on Trans Am. But again, that W code 301 doesn't appear on this. So it could be, this is early model year data and the 301 arrived later. Remember, 79 was another gas shock. Fuel went crazy, people went nuts. Well, look at this right here. The CC1 hatch, the T-tops, 655 bucks. Not seen on this one. Uh, again, we have here hood decal. Look at this, D53, hood decal, Trans Am only. $95 retail. What that means is your Trans Am would not have the bird if you didn't pay 95 bucks for that option. So I've never seen one. And another bit of controversy is some folks say that the standard hood on a Trans Am was this flat piece with no shaker. If you paid the 95 bucks for the CE5, I think it is right there, excuse me, the D53, you've got the decal and the shaker hood. I've never seen a Trans Am with a flat hood, but I've read that a couple places, that you paid extra money, 195 bucks, for the sticker and the scoop. Remains to be determined on that one. I'm sure Google user GP will let us know on that one. But with that said, uh, this one almost certainly had a shaker hood, as uh, just about every Trans Am I've ever seen did. Uh, these, of course, have power disc brakes up front. Power disc brakes at the rear were an option starting in 79. Uh, and something also unique about Trans Ams is the front sway bar. Here's my little dial indicator right here. The front sway bar is this thing right here. This is an anti-roll bar. This connects to lower control arms. And on Trans Ams only, this is 1.125 inches diameter. On a Formula or an Esprit or a lesser car, this would be 1.1 inches in diameter. So again, a small amount made a big difference in the roll couple and the stiffness of the Trans Am suspension. So one thing about Trans Am was that even though it didn't have, you know, 370 horsepower like it might have in 70 or, you know, the Ram Air D, D ports and stuff like that, uh, these had like 220 horsepower or 180, depending on which engine you had, but they handled like a Porsche. And a lot of that was thanks to the big wheels, sticky tires. This one here is some aftermarket silly wheels on it and look at the rust oh my gosh this uh i've never seen a wheel actually rust through <laughs> like that but hey we're in massachusetts right look at this pretty crazy stuff now this would have had five spoke rally twos or the optional snowflake aluminum wheel and that was a long long time ago now on this one here we also try to open a door can't see anything about transmission it was almost certainly an automatic car which would have been a turbo 350 in 1979 the 400 was thing in the past speaking of the past this is Car and Driver magazine right here, April 76. Now this is a 79, so three years earlier, this test was done on a 455 Trans Am. But here's the thing, this tells us a lot about the 70s, the smog 70s. And if we look at this magazine article here, we'll see Speed Lives, the fastest American car. Now keep in mind that in April of 76, the national 55 mile an hour speed limit was just being enforced. And there's a lot of pushback. Car and Driver was one of the big ones to say, you know what, Uncle Sam, stuff it. And here it is right here. This car and driver bicentennial, 1976, civil disobedience test, finding the fastest American car. Don't you guys know there's a 55 mile an hour speed limit? Don Sherman wrote this piece. Well, they grabbed all the top American cars, put them to test on a closed course, and check this out. Which one was the fastest? Top speed, of course, Corvette, there you go. And they say here expensive, and went 124 miles an hour, L82. Expensive, but speed in the same league will cost you half again as much if you buy off the import rack, Porsche, Ferrari, et cetera. Second, the Dart Sport 360, which went 121 miles an hour. America's fastest sedan is also one of its most innocuous. It blends into traffic like a lane divider, basically the 340 Duster or Dart Swinger with a 360 for 1976. Third fastest was the Trans Am 455 at 117 miles an hour. It says here, our only surviving muscle car may be getting out of shape, but it's still dazzled the contenders with its footwork. And number four was a 454 Chevy Silverado, which went 110 miles an hour, seven miles per hour, slower than the Trans Am. And it says here, not the fastest way to go, but one of the kinkiest, forward weight bias, plus a monster motor, make it a tire burner. And in fifth place, yes, the Mustang II Cobra II at 105 miles an hour, 15 miles per hour slower than the Dart Sport 360, and 20 miles an hour slower than the Corvette. And here on this page here, it gets worse. Here are the specs on these things. And the Trans Am, the 455, 1976, the final year for the 455. And check this out, it made 200 horsepower. Depressing. Zero to 60 in seven seconds, quarter mile 15.6 at 90 miles an hour. Not horrible, but again, just uh, dark, dark days. And by 1979, when this car was built, 
the 455 was long gone. And again, 79 was the last year, the 403 or the 400 could be had. From 80 through 81, you had a 301 or a 305 Chevy in California or the turbo 301 meltdown motor. So you know, that's the story on that. Now the rear of this car, the rear axle is gone, but the beauty of Trans Ams is they all had an eight and a half inch 10 bolt rear axle, the same thing basically found under a Grand National, pretty strong axle, and they all had safety tracks. So in other words, you didn't pay extra for limited slip, which is cool. Now the rear axle is gone on this one. It's possible this had the J65 four wheel disc brakes, which were first seen in 1979. The axle's gone, it can't tell us. But we do see here a couple of uh, Gabriel hijackers, air shocks right here. You can see the airline going to the back of the car through the bellows right here. So if you had a carload of buddies, you would definitely want to uh, air these things up so the car wouldn't squat. Here's dual exhaust, of course, standard on Trans Am. But if you went under this thing, you'd actually find these dual pipes merge into a single catalytic converter underneath the passenger side floor. So it really wasn't dual exhaust. The 70s were awfully about simulation rather than actual muscle. You know, today in 2023, you know, the Demon, the ZL1 Camaro, I mean, uh, the GT500 Mustang, GT350 Mustang with an 8,000 RPM Coyote, uh, or you know, the, 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 uh, the Voodoo engine, I never thought we'd see cars like that ever in 79 when this was the big deal. And in the back of the Trans Am, we can see right here uh, the legendary spoiler, which kind of does something. Over 120, it probably creates some downforce, but otherwise on Main Street USA, it sells the heck out of Pontiacs. And again, there were 117,109 of these Trans Ams built in 79. It was the peak year for Trans Am output. The least amount of power, well, almost 80 was the pits with the turbo engines, but you know, not a lot of power, but people bought the heck out of these things. It just goes to show when Pontiac built excitement, uh, the excitement was part of it. it, was marketing and image, and the other half of it was performance. But again, these things handled about as well as anything else on the road, largely in part due to their excellent suspension and wide tires. But again, these cars were as good as it got, in 1979, and uh, things would only get better with the second and third gen, or the third and fourth gen Firebirds with LS1 power, of course, you know, crossfire injection, four wheel disc brakes, uh, better stuff. But the big blocks, the 403s and 400s, were died right here in 79. But this one, again, is a weirdo. The W in the fifth spot of the VIN tells us this may well have been a 301 four barrel base, or like maybe a, a, d a delete option uh, for the smog and, uh, and emissions crisis in 1979. But anyway, that's the story of uh, how this Trans Am has gone from the disco circuit to the junkyard circuit here at, on the Junkyard Crawl. If you like this video, be sure to ring the bell to be alerted for future videos and to subscribe to the Steam Magazine YouTube channel. We'll see you tomorrow with more Junkyard Crawl.